All right. Okay. Um, great. Thanks very much. Uh, it's it's really a, a pleasure to be here to be able to take take part in the conference. And um, yeah, thanks uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Thanks, Robbie, for the kind introduction. Um, so it's it's always a you know a, a real pleasure to be at the web conference since it's really a conference that addresses what are some of the most central questions that we face in com in computing and its related disciplines. How do we how do we best build the online world? How do we develop the information and the social potential of it? And how do we design the computational agents that are going to help us to navigate it, which are really, I think, the themes that we've been seeing th throughout this conference. And in a way, the ideas underpinning the web are, of course, very old. And so I often feel like when we start to talk about things involving the web, we should really go back to some of the, you know, the original conceptualization. Um, in, in a way, if you think about it, you know, the web has always been balanced between these two metaphors, right? If you were to say, like, you know, how do we think about the web, there's always been the metaphor of the library, right? This gigantic universal library of all human knowledge, you know, where the basic units are, you know, the pages, the hyperlinks, the associations. And then balanced against that is the metaphor of the crowd, right? That we go online to experience crowds of people and the social dynamics they generate. And the sort of basic units there are often quite different looking, right? The sort of real-time awareness that comes from being in a crowd, the social contagion, and the other social dynamics. Now, these both feel like very kind of, you know, 1990s, 2000 era metaphors, but they actually both have their roots in thinking that actually informed a lot of the early design of the web, right? The metaphor of the library comes from what you might call the founding text of the web, Vannevar Bush's Atlantic Monthly article, as we may think, which I've I often like to invoke these quotes in um, in talks about this. It's it's worth always kind of on some regular basis going back just to remind yourself how specific he was about the whole idea of you know large online encycl large universal encyclopedias with associative trails, and even the whole new profession of trailblazers you know who will actually establish paths through all that information. That was the metaphor of the library, right? The metaphor of the crowd is, in a sense, equally old, also from the middle of the 20th century. It came from the sociology of mass communication and these influential uh, early thinkers on it, like Elihu Katz and Paul Lazarsfeld, who, when they studied, you know, studied the disruptive effects of technological change on things like the political process, in their case through radio and TV, they kept running into this surprising fact that it wasn't really, you know, the radio or the printed page that was having the effect on people, but it was other people. Right, that the information would get dropped into the network and then it would spread through all those people in the network. And one thing we learn from this, I guess, is that, you know, if we read Katz and Lazarsfeld, is that at some level, all media is social media because you put information into the medium, but the way it actually travels is really through the people. And so obviously the question is, if all level, if all media is social media, then when we call what we have today on the internet social media, what actually distinguishes it? Surely it's not the social part, but something does distinguish it. And what distinguishes it is modern social media is algorithmic media, right? And in a way, this of course is something we all understand, but it's again good to remind ourselves of this fact that that's what distinguishes it, right? That it's computationally mediated, it's optimized by the platforms that show it to you. And in a way that, you know, the radio programmers or the newspaper editors in the Katz and Lazarsfeld era couldn't possibly have aspired to, right? No editor, no matter how sophisticated their knowledge of their audience is, could be targeting the information in the way that modern algorithms are. And so with that, a kind of narrative emerges about what, what we have, you know, presently in the online world, this narrative that algorithms create the environments in which we operate, right? They are the environment, the algorithm. You're walking around in the system, but somehow the algorithm is actually sort of creating these force fields that steer you through it. And a crucial part of this narrative in the last, say, five to 10 years has been that sometimes these algorithms seem to be guiding us in ways that we don't want, right? There's this paradox, which I sort of hope to kind of unravel a little bit, our interpretation on it in this talk, that the paradox is somehow these algorithms are highly optimized for our experience online. And the more they optimize, some people feel, the less happy we get. And how is, that, you know, how is that possible? And if you want sort of reminders of this, they're sort of everywhere, right? The fact that we have to invent a term called doom scrolling to kind of capture the idea that, you know, part of you is 
reading one piece of terrible news after another, and the other part of you wants to stop and just put away your phone. Right? The fact that people joke about being you know, professional internet quitters, the fact that people go on Reddit and they ask questions like, how do I spend less time on YouTube, when the answer at some level should be obvious, um, suggests that there's some paradox here. Right? Repeated optimization is making us less happy. It's a, that's one of the sort of narratives which I want to sort of pull the thread on a little bit. Now, a second narrative has been emerging in all of this, and we see it certainly at this conference, right? It's, it's, it's one of the sort of dominant themes in this conference, that algorithms don't just create the environment that we inhabit, but algorithms are also sort of our partners in all of this, right? That the algorithm, there's the big algorithm, the platform algorithm that's deciding what we see, but then there's sort of like the small algorithm, the algorithm just off to our side, again, in this metaphorical conception, both of them are actually just pieces of code running on giant data centers, in fact, probably the same data center. But the one that metaphorically is just off to our side is somehow potentially a partner, potentially helping us. And here too, uh, obviously, and we've heard this in a number of the talks, there's this looming worry, just as we worry about the environments we're building that, that, that house us online, we worry about the partners at our side, partly because of this diffuse responsibility that exists between us and them. Right? If we and this AI partner form some sort of hybrid team as we navigate and do things on the web, then when things go wrong, exactly whose responsibility is it, right? And how is it that things go wrong anyway, right? It, it feels like you can have situations, right, many situations that we see in the news where the problem almost seems to be not in me or in the AI, but somehow in the fumbled handoff between us. That somehow, because I don't understand it and it doesn't really understand me, when we go to do things jointly, something doesn't quite work out. And so that's sort of a second, not quite paradox, but a second kind of narrative thread that I, I want to think about. And these, in a way, are going to be the sort of two halves of this, of this talk, right? Two ways of thinking about algorithms as they exist today on the web and the challenges that they pose, right? First, algorithms as creators of environments and the ways in which the more we optimize them, there's the risk that the less happy we get. And secondly, algorithms as powerful partners where we get this kind of new kind of error that can emerge where the error is not mine or the AI's, but somehow in the fact that we don't quite interact correctly together. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, let me let me launch into the first one of these, right? Algorithms that create the environments we're in. So, w w where were we on that narrative? There was this picture, right? That you know we have doom scrolling, we have spending more time than we want on online, a growing body of um, empirical work, both in computer science and also in, the, in behavioral economics, other parts of behavioral science, on this exact issue, right? Measuring, in fact, some of the ways in which, for example, if you incentivize people to leave social media for a period of a week or a month, you know, at the end they report actually being happier than when they were, you know, than the, at the start of the experiment. And so this was the situation we were at uh, when, um, with two of my co-authors, Sentil Mulanathan, a behavioral economist at the University of Chicago, and Manish Raghavan, my former PhD student now at MIT, we were thinking about this question and we really wanted to get at this issue of like platform optimization and the ways in which if we make certain behavioral assumptions, it can start to go wrong. Now, when we did that, we wanted to think about something which actually uh, came up in uh, Jia Tong's talk, very nice keynote yesterday morning, the idea of sort of dual self models. Right? There's clearly a dual self issue going on here. Now, Jia, when he talked about it, was sort of dual self for problem solving. Here, it's a kind of dual self model for, let's call it consumption or preference. Right? Let's actually talk about this professional internet quitter who has advice. It sort of suggests that there's a, a split in your preferences. Right? There's a part of you that wants to keep scrolling through your newsfeed, and there's a part of you that wants to override that and leave. And in some sense, these two sides are sort of arming up, you know, are being armed up by opposing forces, right? The platform is optimizing for the part of you on the right that wants to stay. And maybe this person who's kind of giving you life coaching advice is over here on the left trying to sort of pull you, pull you away from it. But however it works, there are these competing, conflicting preferences that, that you have. And the point is really not to say that one of these is correct and one of these is the error, right? They're both you. Right? The you that stays up too late scrolling and the you that regrets that the next day, they're both you. Those are both your preferences. They just happen to be in conflict. It just, what it's saying is it's not sensible to claim that you have a single set of preferences and we're trying to find them. 
And that's, I guess, the worry. Because if you don't have a single set of preferences that we're trying to find, then what exactly are we doing when we look at your clicks? Right? If you have multiple sets of preferences that are at war with each other, then maybe we need to actually have a different conception of like what it is we're doing when we analyze your behavior online. Okay. So two conflicting sets of preferences, mutually inconsistent. Um, this is a well-known idea in the behavioral sciences, right? And so when Sentel, Manish, and I start out, we were able to draw on Sentel's background in behavioral e e economics, and he kind of guided us through some of the ways this has shown up historically uh, in theories of human behavior. And fundamentally, when we think about two inconsistent sets of preferences and we think about consumption, it's really a battle between want and should, right? We all kind of understand want and should, right? We have a break, perhaps, after the session, and, you know, at some conferences you go out and you see the junk food and the healthy food, right? You have the chips and the salad. Um, and so part of you, you know, is like, I should have the salad because that'd be good for me, and part of you wants the chips, right? Want versus should. Now, a bit closer to our concern, media consumption, there's, of course, also want versus should, you know, in that case, right? So you're taking a long flight across the Pacific, there are movies on the plane, you're trying to figure out what to watch. Part of you thinks, I really should watch this documentary about the font Helvetica, because I'll really learn a lot. It'll be a great topic for conversation. Um, I do recommend this documentary, actually. It's, it's quite good. Um, but another part of you wants to watch the Marvel movie. Okay? I think like, the creators of that documentary actually uh, understood this, because in the small print there, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, it, you know, it says, start watching with your public library card or university login, as though deep down they know that the only people possibly watching this have either a public library card or a university login. So now, both of these, food consumption and media consumption, there's a lot of empirical history with these. And the empirical work on this suggests that the tension is often plays out in ways that involve multiple timescales, right? So a lot of evidence that in the battle between want and should, want happens in the present, and should happens first prospectively in the future as you plan, and later retrospectively as you either, you know, feel happy or feel regret at the decisions that you made. So in the food domain, for example, uh, this team of behavioral economists, um, Katie Milkman, Todd Rogers, Max Bazerman, looked at data on online grocery orders, where you can hand label all the items, you know, and so you have a hand labeling of things on a want to should axis. Um, and they looked at how far in advance the groceries were being delivered. And even if you, you control for things like freshness and spoilage, online grocery orders contain more should items when they're placed to be received further in the future, right? So you're pretty sure that three days from now, you will definitely want to have salad and vegetables. Right now, of course not. You'd rather have chips. But three days from now, that version of you certainly wants the salad. Similarly, as you as you, as you all know, Netflix was once upon a time a mail order DVD company before it was a streaming company. And so you can look at <clears throat> mail order for uh, DVDs in the mail. And they discovered that when you had violations of the FIFO principle, right, I ordered A before B, but I returned B before A, right? So when B showed up, I ordered two movies, A and B. B showed up, it jumped the queue, got watched immediately and returned. It was very often that A was a, a should movie um, and B was the want movie. It also reminds us that when you change the modality, you might change literally all the data that you're collecting, right? So one point that they make sort of in the work that built on this paper makes is that, you know, shortly after things like the Netflix prize competition 15 years ago in 2009, where people, you know, tried to really dramatically improve the recommendations of Netflix, just after that, Netflix moved from being mail order to streaming. And all of a sudden, the nature of the data changed completely. Because a mail order company is fundamentally about what you want to watch three days from now. And three days from now, you certainly want to watch the documentary that will make you a more educated person. A on a streaming platform, the user is simply ask answering a fundamentally different question, which is, what do I want to do right now? And so all the data that went into, for example, the Netflix prize competition was from the mail order era. And all those models were about a class of human beings that simply no longer existed once you went to streaming, right? Because everybody was behaving differently. And so we have to remember that even the modality as you change the sort of temporality of it, as you change the distance into the future, is going to change the kind of data that we collect. OK. So obviously, this is kind of crucial, because now let's go back to platform optimization. And of course, a basic question platforms have to answer is, what is it that users want? And a fundamental principle of user modeling 
in a sense so fundamental that we usually don't stop to actually state it, is the principle that economists call revealed preference. Right? Revealed preference says people choose what they want, and so therefore your choice reveals your preference. Um, right? This is sort of the whole premise of collecting digital trace data. And obviously, I'm not here to claim that we should stop you know, using some version of this as a heuristic. I'm here to say that we should remember that this is an approximation to reality in certain very important ways. And one of the ways that we don't really you know, talk about that much is that if you have internal conflict, if you have two sets of preferences that are at war with each other, then what does it mean to infer, quote, your preferences? Right? Your preferences is not just a single set of preferences. And so that, I think, is the question that we need to, to think about. And that's what's going to motivate a little model that I'm going to build starting on the, on the, on the next slide. Right? And what's going to emerge is that whether revealed preference depend, leads to the correct conclusion is not a yes-no question. It's not that revealed preference is right or that it's wrong. Rather, that it depends on the kind of content being chosen. Right? So revealed preference might make more sense for salad than for chips. In the case of you know, the bowl of chips, and this is sort of, for whatever reasons, Sendel has this dread of bowls of chips. And so he often tells the story about, at a party, you stand next to the bowl of chips, and you, you eat all of them. And now the bowl's empty, and your host comes and takes the bowl. And part of you um, hopes that the host takes the bowl back into the kitchen and just never brings it out again. And part of you hopes they come back with a new bowl of chips. But a platform that's looking at click data will simply always refill the bowl of chips. That's what's that's what's designed to do, right? So that's that's kind of the question. So we want to build a model of what's going on here, and because in the end, if we want to think about how might platforms deal with inconsistent preferences, the language they're going to carry that out in is the language of some kind of a mathematical model of user behavior. And so I want to sort of quickly sketch a model that we might try using in this uh, in this in this context to try to see, can we actually get at this idea that if we're doing optimization in too simple a way, we might actually optimize, optimize, optimize for engagement and make the user less and less and less happy, right? And we'll sort of feel like the model has done what we were trying to do if that dichotomy happens, right? We keep optimizing, we're improving the measurable metrics, but meanwhile, some notion of user happiness is going down, right? Can we actually see that happen in some simple model? And the answer is we can. So here's, here's the model we have in mind. And, in the work that we did, we had a kind of hierarchy of different models. I'll tell you about the simplest one, because the simplest one, we can actually do the calculations in our heads in real time. So we're imagining a user consumes a linear feed of content, right? So, you know, a Facebook news feed, a YouTube playlist, a timeline, et cetera. Um, and so their main decision is whether I just continue on to the next item. Now, the user has two sets of preferences. Um, and actually, in an echo of Jazz talk from yesterday, we will call them system one and system two. And again, yesterday, in Jazz's really nice keynote, it was system one and system two were about two ways of problem solving, I would say. Here it's about two forms of consumption. Okay? System one, because it has the number one, is faster. It acts first. System two is slower, reflective, capable of planning. And so what we're going to do is sort of take the perspective of system two. Because it's going to be system two that decides, do I even want to be here in, the, in advance? And it's going to be system two that later looks back retrospectively and asks, was I happy with my experience? Um, but system one acts first. When it sees the next item in the timeline, that item t produces some utility u sub t for system one, drawn from some distribution u. And system one really isn't capable of planning. If it sees the cookie and it looks good, it just eats it. And so, Basically, all that matters is, is this utility positive, in which case system one consumes, or negative, in which case it loses interest. So we'll say with probably P, U sub T is positive. And if so, system one consumes the item and moves on to step T plus one. And if UT is less than or equal to zero, then system one temporarily is disengaged, and it hands control over to system two. Okay? So that's a system two is only sometimes in control, right? You're scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. At some point, system one gets bored temporarily. And that's the moment when system two can decide, do I still want to be here? How does system two decide that? So system two is capable of using long range planning when it's in control. And so item T gives system two some utility V sub T drawn from some other distribution with mean V bar. Okay. Now, how do, system two has to evaluate V bar. How good is V bar? How does it compare to other things? And so what's going to compare it to is some outside option, 
right? So there's some outside option with value w for leaving the site and, you know, like getting on with the rest of your life. And so this item with value vt and this item outside option with value w, we look at the difference. The net utility from this item is vt minus w. Okay? So part of it is, is vt minus w positive? But remember, system two is capable of planning. And so it's not just saying what is the current item, but also what's my expected value going forward into the future. Now it doesn't know the, all the future values, but it knows v bar, the mean. And I guess one more thing we need in the model, right? If you take the model literally so far, then the problem is if either v bar is less than w, in which case it's a net negative in expectation to be here, you should leave, or v bar is greater than w, in which case I haven't explained to you why system two would ever leave, right? If what's on the site is more valuable than what's off the site, why wouldn't you just stay? And the answer, of course, is there's one final ingredient, which is the idea of satiation, right? Over time, you satiate on this thing that you're consuming. So there's some diminishing returns. Now, there are a few ways to model diminishing returns. One is that it's simply the value of the items is decreasing according to some schedule as t increases. Um, that leads to some calculations that we would not be able to keep track of in our heads. So I'll tell you a slightly simpler model that gives you roughly the same. Um, and in our work, we work out all these models and they lead to roughly equivalent conclusions. So the simpler model is that there's a kind of random on-off transition that system two goes through. So every step, some coin gets flipped. With probably Q, system two is still interested in, and still gets value from its content. But with probably one minus Q, the coin comes up tails, and now system two is full. I am satiated. I do not want to be here anymore. That means all future consumption for system two will give value zero because it's satiated. And meanwhile, it's losing its outside option of W. OK. Now, System two knows this, so when system two thinks out t steps into the future, it knows that the chance it will still be interested is q to the t, because it has to remain interested that whole time. And so it can build that into its calculations, right? So the future is sort of being exponentially discounted, mainly essentially because of this, this satiation. So it says content has, in this model, three properties, all of which are recognizable from the way we consume content, right? So one is the value the expected net utility per item for system two, this V bar minus W. Second is the satiation rate. This probably Q that you're gonna remain interested per item. Um, and three is this term behavioral economists call moorishness, how much you just impulsively want more. The probably P that system one is in control when consuming a piece of content, okay? And again, content can be good and differ in these parameters, right? So like, you know, a movie has rapid satiation. After you watch a movie, it's quite possible you're like, I'm full. Whereas, you know, a very short video might have a different satiation. Okay, so we're in PQV space, right? Content is somehow described by this triple P, Q, and V. And now let's take system two's perspective and think about this utility. System two, looking at the platform, faces a choice. Do I want to go on the platform at, at all? Let's, for now, assume that the decision to go on the platform in the first place and begin a session is under system two's control. We should come back to that question, right? Is, is that really a system two decision? Is it sometimes a system one decision? Let's say system two is planning, do I want to go on the platform? Now you should only go on the platform if you believe that the expected utility from that session is positive. Otherwise, you just shouldn't go there. You end up getting net, u, negative utility. So how can we make that calculation? So actually the model we have is clean enough that we can actually just do that calculation on a couple slides and see what we conclude. So the user session conceptually has two phases. I mean, what it actually is is just a series of item consumptions. You just scroll, 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 and eventually you leave. But for purposes of analysis, we can think of two, two phases. Phase one, while system two is still harvesting value, and phase two, after system two has satiated. So what happens in phase one? Well, in phase one, system two is collecting value V bar minus W per step. And how long is it on, how long does phase one last? Well, we're waiting for a coin to come up tails. The tails probably is one minus Q, so the length of phase one is one over one minus Q. And therefore, the expected utility, to temporarily use the little acrobat hand here, is V bar minus W per step over one minus Q. Now phase two. System two would like to leave. Does system two get to leave? Well, not quite yet, because system one might still be impulsively consuming content. How long does that happen? Well. The expected length of that is waiting for a different coin to come up tails, right? It has to be, with probably P, system one is engaged. They have to stop being engaged. 
So the expected length is p over 1 minus p. This extra p because you might get lucky and system one is immediately disengaged, so we have a chance of zero. And you're getting minus w utility per step there. Okay, so now we can write down the utility. It's this random variable uh, with expectation that's v bar minus w over 1 minus q minus pw over 1 minus p. Right, so some kind of terms in the numerator that are, you know, but the main thing to look at is it's sort of something over 1 minus q minus something over 1 minus p. The max of that would zero, because if you're going to get negative expected utility, then you just don't go there. Okay. Finally, so far this has been just a story about the user and their decisions. Let's now start to think about what it is the platform sees and what it is the platform might be optimizing. So the platform doesn't see your utility. It doesn't see whether you're happy with these things you're consuming. It sees the length of your session. It sees what you consumed. And so the session length is the other relevant thing here, and that's a random variable with expectation 1 over 1 minus q plus p over 1 minus p. Okay. So now we see this is the tension that's going on. These two terms, if there were no behavioral effects, if this was just, if you were just all system two, you had perfect self-control, then the value is constant over 1 minus q, and the length of the session is 1 over 1 minus q, a perfect argument for maximizing engagement. The more you're engaged, the happier you are, right? That's the whole principle of engagement optimization. But when you do have system one, then there's a one over, there's a constant over one minus p term. And that works oppositely for utility and engagement. For engagement, it adds to the length of the session. And for utility, it subtracts from the length of the session. Okay? And so that's where this wedge opens up between engagement optimization and user utility, right? The thing we were sort of potentially hoping or expecting to see. Um, and so what's going on? P equals zero, we understand. But when P is non-trivial, right, when it's, you know, positive, then large engagement could mean the first term is high, good utility, or the second term is high, which means you're losing utility. So now think about briefly what this might mean for platform, in platform optimization, okay? So if I think about platform optimization, the platform now has to decide what kind of content to recommend. And that's, again, coming from some feasible region in PQV space, right? Let's call that a sort of content manifold. Because it's not clear the platform can just, you know, genetically engineer a piece of content that has the exact PQV parameters it wants. It can manipulate some latent coordinates of the content, some latent features, which produces PQ and V. Now, the platform can measure engagement but not utility. And the question we're asking is, if the platform optimizes for the engagement, what is the effect on the utility? And this gets back to the fact that the answer is not always one thing or always another thing. It depends on whether we're in the part of the manifold corresponding essentially to chips or to salad. So let's see how that, how that works out, okay? And again, we can, obviously when we say the platform and the platform optimization, we can think of this story in kind of a couple of ways, right? We can think of it as the platform is optimizing for engagement and therefore, you know, user utility might go up or down. But we could also think of this as maybe this is you building a browser plugin to help you be a more effective user of your online experience, right? Maybe you built this optimizer. It's trying to find content for you. And so it's altruistically trying to make you as happy as possible. Even in that world, where there are no mixed incentives, there's still a communication bottleneck between you and the browser proxy that you built. Because the browser proxy just sees your clicking behavior. And so even though it's trying to help you, it can't actually see your utility. It just sees the clicks that you make. Okay? So we can think of this sometimes as a mixed incentive problem between the platform and you, but sometimes just as a communication bottleneck between the agent that's trying to help you and your actual utility. All right. So what does this look like? Like, what do I mean by a content manifold? So let's pick some, you know, simple examples here. Um, maybe the simplest example is just... Uh, so content manifold, it's parameterized by some latent coordinates. So the content the platform can create, you know, looks like it, it can vary x. So it has this dial that we'll call x. x ranges from 0 to epsilon. As you vary x, p remains 0, q increases. So essentially the span of the content, right, the sort of longevity of it goes up. That's good. And the value goes up. Again, there's just an example I'm making up so we can look at it. Right, so this is sort of, this first example is a classic case of like why you would want engagement optimization. Because um, T increases and S increases both as you increase X. I turn the dial on X, expectation of T goes up, expectation of X goes up, you should maximize engagement. 
Let's look at the other kind of extreme of this. Again, the platform finds it has this dial it can turn called X. As it turns X, it varies the content. But now what's happening is it simply raises the Moorishness. As you turn X, P just gets larger and larger and larger. Q and V stay the same. So now what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is described in these, these curves that you have this knob and the engagement starts going up. You say, oh, as I turn this knob, they're spending longer and longer on the platform, just like they did in the previous case. Unbeknownst to you, the utility is going down, 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 down. Until one day, you, you get to this cliff and the user now thinks the utility is negative. Right, so the user has these longer and lo is more and more engaged, happier and happier as far as you can tell, and one day they're just not there at all. Because from the user's point of view, they said, I'm just not going back, I waste too much time on this platform, it's a net negative. Right, and so you essentially ran were running toward this cliff that you eventually fell over. Now of course, there, you know, we can imagine more complicated examples, and in particular, you know, it's not the case that everything that's more engaging to your impulsive system oneself is also worse. Right? There are, after all, things that are valuable that are also engaging. That's what we aspire to. Right? We aspire to create content that's both engaging in the moment and also of value. And so you can imagine some, you know, let's say third example, where again we have this dial, X, we're turning. We don't quite know what it does. We just know as we turn it, the user behaves a little differently. What's actually happening is we're raising the Moorishness. We're also raising the value. Right? We're raising both. And so what that means is that for a while, we're in the part of the manifold where utility and engagement are going up together. Engagement is a good signal for utility for a while. Unbeknownst to us, we sort of pass the global maximum. And to us, the engagement just keeps going up. But now we're entering the zone, right? We've left the salad zone and we've entered the chip zone. And now engagement's going up until, again, we go over this cliff and one day the user doesn't want to come back at all. So we can build a bunch of these examples. Um, we can create much more complicated ones essentially through mixtures, right? Anytime I have some of these examples, right, think of each of these as a, a sort of primitive media source. I can just mix them with different weights. And I, I won't go into all, all the details here. I, I can just say I, I want some fraction of this, some fraction of that. Essentially, I built the third example by mixing the first two, right? The sort of, you know, pure system two, pure system one. And taking mixtures can also teach us interesting things, you know, that this model is sort of rich enough to capture. You know, so for example, imagine I took a mixture of two sources here. One is something with, you know, no Moorishness and has some value. And another one that has very high Moorishness and more value. Then there is some optimal mixture of these things, like there was in my third example. You could imagine, for example, that um, one of the media sources might be no Moorishness, some satiation, and zero value. What's that? That's like a break. That's like a gap where you just stare at the screen, get system one's not engaged, and system two gets no value. And so it's interesting that you can create examples where mixing that in turns the platform from something you don't want to visit to something you do want to visit. Because essentially it convinces system two that they will be able to leave on a predictable basis. This is exactly what you see when large platforms, as more and more of them are doing, introduce enforced breaks, right? I go into my profile and I say, you know, I program it, I say, Every 15 minutes, I would like a 30 second break where nothing is happening. And you ask yourself, for a platform that's obsessed with engagement, why would you let the user program in that every 15 minutes you sit there doing nothing? And the answer is this model, simple though it is, with this simple mathematical agent, if you gave them that option, now they would go to the platform. Because you've essentially promised system two that at least every 15 minutes they'll be in control and they can leave if they want to. Right, and without that, you, you lose that. So this thing that seems very human, right, that breaks might paradoxically cause you to want to join, actually emerges from a, a model, that, even one that's, that's, that's this simple. So the idea here in this sort of first half of the talk was to sort of start from, again, this paradox, that the more we optimize, the less happy people seem to get sometimes. And that's exactly what this curve is saying, right? The orange is being optimized. The utility is going down until one day the user is not there at all. And it gives us this language for thinking about a bunch of design choices in the online world, right? Primarily how to interpret the data we collect, how to move beyond revealed preference. It also lets us think about other things such as surveys, right? I haven't talked about surveys here, but you can think about, you know, those surveys that pop up in social media, like how are you enjoying your experience today? You know, very good, good, medium, and so forth, as essentially the platform reaching out through the screen and saying like, I would like to talk to system two directly, right? May I please speak to system two? Because filling out a survey is a very system two activity, right? It's not impulsively engaging, it's reflective. And so we can try to collect that data at different points in, 
in the in the session and try try to learn from that. Um, I haven't I've been talking about a linear feed. Uh, we can also talk about branching tree-like structures in which you're actually choosing among options. Uh, we've talked about the benefits of enforced breaks. There are other interesting things, right? The unexpected effects of embedding one medium in another one. So I I had asked this question. Who actually controls the decision to go on the platform? Is it system one or is it system two? And you know we've taken here in the model that it's it's a it's a, a planning decision, so it's a system two decision. But you can imagine sometimes you reason as follows: you say, I often read the news, um, but I tend not to read it on like Saturdays and Sundays because on Saturdays and Sundays they embed all these like YouTube clips of things from TV the night before. And I find myself like, you know, I, I know enough not to spend too much time on YouTube, but now I'm reading the news, and before I know it, this thing is autoplaying in my browser and I'm watching YouTube, which I was trying not to do. Right? And so essentially by embedding one medium in another, you've actually sort of trans transformed the system two decision into a system one decision. Right? We actually know this from like the world of food consumption. Right? So like you walk through the airport and you know not to stop at the place that sells the thousand calorie cinnamon rolls that you really like that are not good for you. But the cinnamon roll place knows this also. So they pipe the smell of the cinnamon roll out into the concourse. So that as you're walking through, system one is already eating the cinnamon roll. Right? It's tilted the balance of power between system one and system two. And we see that in the world of you know, consumption. In the physical world, we see that in the world of media consumption as well. OK. So this is sort of the first theme I want to talk about in this, in the, in this talk, which is the algorithm creates the environment in which we operate. There's a dual self model, there's some communication bottleneck, some conflict there that leads to these, these very tricky questions. I want to talk about the second narrative that was informing this talk, which is the algorithm as a partner, where again we have a kind of communication bottleneck between two entities, right, between you and this powerful AI system. And Again, there's a kind of system one, system two dimension. Now, more in the sense that Jam meant in his keynote yesterday, you, you know, a kind of heuristic problem solver who has limited cognitive ability, no offense to any of us here, you know, and then some powerful algorithm that has the ability to do much more computation than you can. And we often worry about the errors that arise and the handoff between us and them, between these two entities, the powerful entity and the, and the weaker entity. Right? We see this in lots of cases, right? So we see generative AI assistance for writing, for coding, for interaction. We can imagine a bunch of speculative sci-fi scenarios where, where this happens, right? So you and a very powerful language model enter into a high-stakes negotiation with somebody. The language model starts out, and they take this very aggressive negotiating posture. And then, you know, you're the, the other side of the negotiation turns to you and says, what do you think? You're not sure because you're not quite not sure. You're not exactly sure what the LLM had in mind when it began with this aggressive negotiating posture. You don't quite know how to follow up on it because there's a communication bottleneck between you and your partner, right? People worry about this with autonomous vehicles, right? In a very different context, that the autonomous vehicle is driving, but suddenly it loses connectivity. The system goes down. It suddenly hands off control to you. If it's driving in a way that you can understand, you can take over the wheel. If it's driving using some elaborate reasoning involving Newtonian physics that you don't understand, it's not clear you know how to take over. It was driving safely. You could drive safely. But something was fumbled in the handoff between you, you and it, just in the same way that you and your negotiation language assistant had different strategies, and something was fumbled in, in the handoff. Now, the danger with all of these things is I'm talking at this level of you and an AI negotiating partner, you and an AI autonomous vehicle that's much better at driving than actual autopilots are right now. These are all sort of speculative. This is all sci-fi. And so the question we asked ourselves was, could we find a domain where we can actually see this happening, right? Where we actually could study this directly, right? A domain with high levels of human mastery and scholarship where nonetheless algorithms have sort of completely eviscerated human performance, where we really do have superhuman AI. AI, right? So a domain in, in, the, in the real world, sort of in the same way that, you know, when the web was still essentially sci-fi, right, in the era, era of Vannevar Bush and afterwards, we looked for the analogs of the web to ask what might happen, and we looked to libraries, right? We hadn't yet collected huge amounts of information in the online world, but we had in physical buildings, and so we said the library will serve as our metaphor for what's going on in the web. Here we want a different metaphor. We don't really yet have superhuman assistance 
for talking or writing, you know, or driving. They're getting better, but they're really not, you know, we, we have not yet gotten to that point. But we do have, meta we have domains that we can use as metaphors, and the one I want to use here is chess. Chess has exactly these properties. Namely, there's 100 years or more of chess scholarship, right? You can fill whole libraries with, you know, with chess books. People train their whole lives to achieve a level of mastery that fills us you know, with awe at, at the capabilities of the best human chess players. And despite all of that, um, at this point, chess engines, when it comes to, if the goal is to win chess games, humans have literally nothing to offer to algorithms, right? In chess, the singularity arrived in 2005, and we've been living in some world since that uh, that's just very, very, looks very, very different, okay? So that's why I like to choose chess as this model system. Now, Chess has sort of been a model system for many things uh, over the years. It's one of the few activities that's been called metaphorically a drosophila for more than one different field of study. Right? It's been a drosophila for psychology and artificial intelligence in much the way that the actual drosophila, the fruit fly, was the model system for genetics. Um, a kind of brief history for those of you who have not been you know, following this. When, um, uh, when a, a bunch of us in this room were at uh, IBM Almaden together in the late 1990s, Deep Blue achieved this milestone achievement by defeating the world champion Gary Kasparov in a, a six-game match. Um, that was kind of the, often, sort of the last time a lot of the public was really paying attention to the human versus machine dichotomy, but they just kept getting better, right? It turned out 1997 was just this accidental sort of collision between a performance curve for computers that was going up very steeply and a performance curve for humans that was going up very, very gradually. Those two curves are gonna cross somewhere, and that was 1997. But the steep curve didn't stop growing. And so the, the last time a human ever defeated a computer running on you know, a desktop machine or stronger was 2005. Um, and so by the time 2018, DeepMind's AlphaZero taught itself the rules of chess through self-play, it was just really light years beyond what humans are capable of. Okay? And so and that quickly entered the public domain. right? So the open source version of AlphaZero, Leela, is something that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in, in the next few slides. Um, the other thing that might help just to kind of navigate through this is the idea of like chess ratings. And so essentially every 400, 500 rating points, right, it's a measure of skill. Every 400, 500 rating points means a kind of like high 90s percent that the better player is going to defeat the worst player, right? As um, people like to point out, you know, the best NBA team versus the worst NBA team or any pro, pro sport, it's kind of a 75, 25 win ratio. A 400 point difference in ELO rating is like a 95% difference in, in skill, much bigger than we see in anything like that. And there are many rungs in this 500 point ladder. So the best humans are around 2800, strong amateurs around 1800. Chess engines are now 3300, 3600, right? They're as much better than the best humans as the best humans are than sort of good amateur players. Okay, so this gives us an opportunity to study interactions between superpowered AI and ordinary humans. Um, so, in some work, th this is now a long-running project that um, Ashton Anderson and I began about eight years ago in 2016, um, to ask the question, can we actually build models that don't try to make optimal chess moves? Their goal is not to win chess games. Their goal is to use a comparable amount of computation to predict what a human of a given rating will play. Right? So I build an engine which is parameterized by this ELO rating X, and it would like to predict the move that a player of rating X will make in a given position. And so in a paper in 2020, we introduced this chess engine Maya, right, sort of a parallel to Leela, but where Leela's goal is to win chess games, Maya's goal is to make predictions about what a human will do. It actually is built on the Leela architecture. I won't go into details in the time I have, but you basically rip the head off of Leela where you know, the optimization head is trying to make good chess moves, and instead replace it with a head that's trying to match what humans of a given rating are doing. Okay. What would it mean for this thing to do well? Well, for different, you know, presumably the move matching accuracy um, as a function of ELO would look something like this, right? So there's a Maya for each rating. So this is like, say, Maya 1200. Maya 1200 makes predictions about humans of different strengths. It's particularly good on humans of rating 1200 because that's what it was optimized to do. But presumably humans of rating 1100 or 1300 are not that different. And so, whereas Maya 1800, was trained to match players of rating 1800. And so it'll do best there and it'll do, you know, okay on 1700, 1900, it'll fall off from there. And to see if we're doing well, we can compare this to simply, you know, Leela or the sort of 
best chess engine by more traditional means, Stockfish, right? So those have the ability to like, you can take their level and just turn down the amount to which they search, make them weaker and weaker and weaker, until by some kind of intermediate value theorem, it's the same strength as you. And so you'll play it about equally. But as people have observed, when you play Leela on about equal strength, it's not because it plays like you. It's because it interleaves very good moves with incredibly bad moves. And somehow, you know, in aggregate, you end up playing it about equally. But it too is a, predict a quote, predictor of human moves. And so if you put all these performance curves together, you actually get this. So again, accuracy goes up here on the x-axis. This is uh, the rating of the player that we feed in and we try to predict. And so what you find is Maya is indeed a much, much better predictor of, um, human, move of human moves than uh, e either Stockfish or Leela. Um, and it has this kind of string art effect that we sort of were hoping to see, which is, you know, Maya 1100 is best at 1100 rate, predicting 1100 rate players, Maya 1300, uh, and so forth. Okay? All right. You know, and so it basically says in a given position, you know, the chess engine finds the best move, and all the different Mayas try to predict what a human of that rating would do, right? So in this particular chess position, and again, we're not going to get into the arcana of chess positions here, but it turns out there's a apparently tempting move that weaker players do, which is to push the pawn to b6, and there's the good move, which is to take the pawn on a6. Stockfish doesn't really think about humans, doesn't really pay any attention to humans, it just goes, well, play the good move. Maya 1100 to 1400, modeling weaker players, thinks that the player is going to push here, and Maya 1500 onward predicts the good move, right? Because as the players get better, they tend to make the correct move. So we released Maya onto Lee Chess, the largest open source chess playing site uh, in the world, where it's now the most used bot uh, online. So it's now played several million games on Lee Chess. We've been able to s see a lot about how, you know, players are able to make use of it. And it has finally given us sort of the ability, it's, it's, it's become now a, t a test bed in which we can now look at some of these model system questions for AI superintelligence, right? So Maya is, is sort of preamble, it's a substrate. Because if we want to build things to study the interaction between humans and super powerful AI, we might want to say, let's train a super powerful chess engine to play well with humans. Right, just the way Alpha Zero or Leela taught itself chess through self-play. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is sort of obvious, which is the algorithm is patient enough to sit through 100 million iterations of self-play, but the human is not. We can't find humans to do as much self-play as a system as voracious as Leela needs to actually get good at playing with humans. But if you have Maya, Maya has the same level of patience as Leela. And so we can create a Maya-Leela feedback loop where Maya is the stand-in for the weak partner, for the human, right? So now we can actually think about systems where Maya and Leela interact with each other and in a way that actually allows us to do unlimited amounts of self-play and not rely on the sort of stamina of, of humans to take part in this, okay? So the particular question that we wanted to ask ourselves was this notion of errors that emerge at the boundary between the strong and the weak partner, right? That basically Leela and Maya go to play chess and somehow, you know, sometimes Leela moves, sometimes Maya moves. And the problem is, I'll, I'll get to the precise description of the task in a second, but that somehow the problem is like, Maya's never quite sure what Leela has in mind, right? There's this fear that like, you know, I don't know your plan because I'm computationally too weak. Th this fear of like sudden handoffs, um, you know, obviously we can think about them sort of in technological domains, but I would argue they're also kind of like a, a primal thing that we all know through like storytelling, right? I was sort of thinking, you know, why does this fear of fumbled handoffs feel so familiar? And I thought back to various like fantasy stories that many of us know. So on the left is the Lord of the Rings. And, you know, in broad strokes, in the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf needs to get rid of this powerful ring of power. And he's like, I have a brilliant idea. Let's march into the heart of enemy territory and throw it into a volcano. And you see all the other, you know, the hobbits and everybody who are much weaker than Gandalf and could not do this on their own. They say, this sounds like a terrible, dangerous plan, but it's okay because Gandalf is here. And of course, what happens in the next few pages of the book? Gandalf vanishes. No more Gandalf. And now these people who have no idea how to carry out this plan are on their own, right? The super powerful entity made up a plan that the rest of them simply could not execute, and now they're gone. On the right, we have the very similar story of the Wizard of Oz, also a march into enemy territory to defeat the magical villain. Um, this is a scene from the, 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 the beginning where um, 
Dorothy and her all-powerful negotiating partner, Glinda, are engaged in a high-stakes negotiation against the Wicked Witch of the West, right? Much as you and the powerful LLM might have marched into a high-stakes negotiation. And Glinda, like the powerful LLM, has taken a very aggressive position against the witch. The witch is very angry, and you, you can almost see on Dorothy's face, like, this is terrifying, but at least Glinda's here to protect me. And what happens five minutes later in the movie, Glinda vanishes, never to be seen again for the rest of the movie. And the whole point of the tension is that now Dorothy is on her own carrying out this plan she doesn't understand against a much more powerful entity. That was the idea, right? Can we get at this fumbled handoff, such as we see in stories, such as we imagine happening with powerful AI? So we created, and this is uh, some work which appeared at iClear last week um, with uh, Kareem Hamade, Reed McElroy Young, um, Ashley Anderson at, at Toronto, who's really led the development of the Maya project, and Sid Sen at Microsoft Research. Um, where Maya runs on, on some, of the, some of the Azure infrastructure there. The five of us thought about this setup of handoffs between weak AI and powerful AI. So if we imagine with humans, imagine a chess game where two Leela human teams play against each other. And the way it works is they can't communicate. On every move, we flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, Leela moves. And if it comes up tails, the human moves. But they can't talk, OK? and they're gonna play each other. And what happens is that, what we can imagine happening, Leela over on the left sees an amazing, you know, winning attack that starts by sacrificing a rook. Leela plays it, because Leela has no idea there's a human next to it. And now it comes back, and the it's the human's, coin comes up tails, it's the human's turn. The human has no idea what to do, right? There is a brilliant follow-up to this rook sacrifice. They don't know what it is, so they play some move. And now Leela on the left says, what have you done? Now we're just down a rook and we're losing, right? Because they had sort of no way to understand each other. So we asked ourselves, you know, first of all, we, we can now replace the human with Maya and actually play, again, tens of millions of these games, uh, again, sides against each other. We asked, could we build a better version of Leela if the goal is to partner with weak AI or with, with humans? In other words, could we build something that we'll call a partner bot that's trained, you know, through self-play or by other means, so that the partnership of partner bot and Maya in this tag team version actually beats the partnership of Leela and Maya, right? So that's gonna, be, that's gonna be the idea. Because if that is, then in some sense, the partner bot, first of all, has to play very good chess. Because to be competitive against a team that has Leela on it, you have to hit some standard. So it's gonna have to be very strong. But it's gonna have, have to make moves that are in some sense comprehensible to a much weaker partner, right? So it's sort of, a different notion of interpretability, interpretability through actions, right? It's not that it gets to explain its actions, so it's not really explainability. It's sort of interpretability through the actions it itself takes. It has to only do things that Maya can understand. And so it gets at this sort of central question anytime we're using powerful AI, which is, is it possible to achieve very high performance without ever doing anything that's incomprehensible to the weak partner that you're working with, okay? And so, there's a lot to say here about the training and sort of exactly how we did this, but given the limited time here, I'll sort of cut to the sort of main outcome, which is in this table at the top. What is the, so we have Leela, so we, we have Leela Meyer partnerships, we have the partner bot as the teammate. You can also just about Maya as the teammate, right? What, what happens if just two, two hobbits march into Mordor? You know, so you have like Maya and Maya against Leela and Maya. Um, and the performance is in the top row, right? So a Leela Maya team against a Leela Maya team has to be 0.5 because they're the same teams. Um, the partner bot does better, right? So it actually has a performance. And so this performs basically its expected win rate against uh, the Leela Maya team. Um, it gets 0.665, so 65%. Having two Mayas play is not going to work. They don't always lose, but they only win roughly 7.5% of the time. At the same time, the partner bot is much weaker than Leela, right? So if, if you now just say, how does the partner bot do against Leela, that's just 14%. So it plays quite good chess, because to ever beat Leela, you have to be very, very good, much better than humans. But it's not actually at the strength of Leela. So it's exactly what you imagined might have happened. We create something which is, in absolute terms, weaker, but much better operating as a partner. OK, and so with that, I want to wrap this, wrap this whole thing up. We've been looking at two different settings in which powerful algorithms are operating with humans with all their cognitive and behavioral limitations. 
And the first of these, the algorithm was creating the outer environment, right? And so it was feeding you content. And we had a human with behavioral biases inside that system. And the issue was that given the bottleneck that made revealed preferences hard to carry out, we had to somehow find a way to feed content in a way that the system two part of this behaviorally biased human was able to derive utility. And in the second part, we thought about the algorithm not as the outer environment, but as your partner in this system. And now it was not a behavioral bias, but a difference in cognitive power that again leads to a communication bottleneck. And the idea was with the right task setup, right, if we set up the task very carefully, we can actually try to train an algorithm to both be powerful on its own, but also to be robust against these unexpected handoffs so that its actions are comprehensible to the weaker parties that it deals with. And I think in the end, right, this captures a lot of the things that we're thinking about right now as we think about large platforms and the agents that can help us navigate them, right? This world, not just with very, very rich information content, as, as we always see on the web, but with increasingly powerful, independent computational en entities roaming around this landscape, working with each other, working with us, creating the environments that we navigate as we explore over this increasingly complicated world of information and algorithms with many, many questions I think, you know, this community is very, very much, you know, ideally set up to think about in the years going forward. Thanks very much.